All right, so today we are starting a new series title. This is going to be a short one. It's only going to last us three weeks because, believe it or not, after three weeks, Christmas starts. Some of you, like, just had a mild panic attack. <laughs> You're like, what? Again? In December this year? I know, every December. So the start of this title, um, we're calling it uh, This is the Way. This is the way. Now, how many of my nerds out there, you thought of The Mandalorian as soon as I said this? Yes, all right. In fact, uh, if you're not familiar with The Mandalorian, uh, this is who he is. Uh, he's a Star Wars character, has his own series on Disney+, Plus, um, has super cool armor, and um, their famous phrase, not just him, but all the other Mandalorian, the people like him, their famous phrase is, this is the way. This is the way. So whenever they say something that kind of goes along with who they are as a people, one of them will say, this is the way, and then all the others reply, this is the way. And so it's become a fun thing, too, in our house when we do things. I'll look at my boys and be like, this is the way, and they're like, you're not that cool, Dad. <laughs> See, but here's the thing. With the Mandalorian, one of their signatures is their armor. They've got this incredible armor, and everyone wears helmets, and you never get to see their faces, except for the one guy, I think it was at the end of season one, and it was kind of like, I don't know if I do want to see his face or not, because it removes the mystery. But that's one of the things that they're known for. But when they use this phrase over and over again, this is the way, that's not just what they're referring to. They're not just referring to their armor, how they dress, how they appear to everyone else on the outside. They're also not just referring to their set of beliefs and teachings. Really, when they say this is the way, they're referring to their way of life. They're referring to their lifestyle to everything that informs and dictates and molds and shapes how they live every single day. This is the way was essentially their religion. And again, not because of anyone or anything that they worshiped, but mostly because of how they lived every single day. And what's funny is that all of us here today, we all have things that we do a certain way because at some point in our lives, someone came along and showed us this is the way we fill in the blank. This is the way we cut the grass. We cut it in nice straight lines, not random circles all over the place. This is the way we wash the car, from the top to the bottom. We don't start with the wheels first and then polish the glass. This is the way we load the dishwasher. There is a right way to load it and a wrong way to load it, and this is the way that we load the dishwasher. This is the way we do the laundry. This is the way we fold the laundry. This is the way we treat others. This is the way we share. This is the way we love our spouse. This is the way we parent our children. And it's funny when we think about it, our life and our lifestyle is really the sum total of all of our this is the ways. And for most of us, we are perfectly content to keep doing things a certain way, right? Until someone comes along and shows us a different way, until someone shows us a better way. And so uh, recently, my parents were over at our house for dinner, and um, somehow we got on the topic of uh, phones and calendars and things. And many of you know, um, my, one of my personal gospels is that every married couple should have a shared calendar on their phone. Um, I will go so far as to make the claim, I believe if this happened, we could knock the divorce rate down significantly. Like, that, that is the gospel that I'm preaching. That is my testimony. If you haven't done it yet, come find me afterward. Uh, if you have an iPhone, 
If you have that other brand, I can't help you. I don't speak that language, okay? But I can get you in touch with someone who does. And so my parents were over at the house and they were like, hey, we wanna figure out how to do that shared calendar thing. I was like, great, give me your phones. And so we're doing it and we're, the main thing, we're trying to get my dad's work calendar onto my mom's phone. And so we finally figured that out after a long time. And it, it was a little risky because she had too much power. Like she had the power to add or delete events and stuff. And I'm like, mom, you gotta be real careful with this. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> that is two comic book references in one message. <laughs> Could we get a third? And so we're trying to do all this, and then we're trying to create a shared calendar, and for whatever reason, we could not do it. I worked on it for an hour. Sarah worked on it, and we couldn't get it. We're like, you're just, you're going to have to go home and, and figure it out on your own. The Lord be with you. But basically, they had a way of doing something, and for a while, it worked, for a while, it worked to have the calendar on the wall and to write things down and to have the planner and to constantly be writing things down, writing things down. This is the way that we do our calendar until someone else came along and said, yeah, but mom, there's, there's a better way. There's a better way. You can just do it in here and it automatically updates and then it automatically lets dad know what you have already planned for them so that he is not allowed to plan something else. She was like, I like that a lot. I said, you are welcome. <laughs> Here's the thing. Long before the Mandalorian and Star Wars and iPhones and calendars, there was another man that walked the earth for a brief period of time and didn't just say, this is the way. No, he was bold enough to make the claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Spoiler alert, his name was Jesus. He said that in John 14, 6. Now, oftentimes when we read this, when we hear this, we immediately go to, okay, when Jesus said this, he was talking about the fact that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and the only way for your sins to be forgiven is to put your faith in him. That's the only way to get to the Father. And that's true. But I believe there's another part of this statement. I am the way. See, the other part goes beyond simply adopting a set of beliefs, and it takes the next step to adopt an entirely different lifestyle. That it's not just, yes, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are and all that you did and that you are the way to the Father. Yes, I believe that. And because of what I believe, I'm actually going to completely change my entire way of living and my lifestyle to model your way of living not just mine. Did you know that before believers were called Christians, they were actually called followers of the way? That's how people referred to them. In fact, the word Christian is only found three times in the entire Bible, twice in the book of Acts, only three times, but this phrase, followers of the way, is found at least twice as many times in the book of Acts alone. And so why is this important? Why does it matter? Here's the reason why. Because Christianity was never meant to be just another religion where what we believe is completely separate from how we live. Let me say that again. Christianity was never meant to be a religion where what we believe is mutually exclusive from how we live. It was always meant to be a way of life. It was always meant to be the way to life more abundantly. 
And yet, from what I observe, so many Christians have adopted a belief in Jesus for who he is and all that he's done without adopting the lifestyle of Jesus, without adopting the way of Jesus. And listen, it was this lifestyle that actually made first century Christianity so attractive to non-believers. It wasn't just what they were preaching, it was actually the way that they lived. And the fact that they lived a radically different lifestyle from everyone else around them, that's what drew people to faith. Not just what they preached, but because they actually lived differently based on what they believed. At the end of Acts chapter two, it begins to describe how the believers formed a community. And and this is how it describes their community. It says, they got together regularly to worship and pray and encourage one another. They met in each other's homes and they shared meals with joy and generosity. And they literally sold their property and their possessions and they shared the money with anyone and everyone that had need. And at the end of that, Acts 2.47, it says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Again, not just because of what they were preaching, but because of the way they were living. They were living a different way. They were living a better way. I want us to look at a familiar passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 11. These are the words of Jesus. It says, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now we have to remember that Jesus is saying these words as a rabbi, as a teacher. And we know this because of this phrase, uh, or, or this phrase, my yoke, that appears twice in this passage. See, rabbis would refer to their teachings and their interpretation of the scriptures as their yoke. Basically, this is how I read the scriptures. This is how I interpret them. This is how I translate them. This is how I teach what they mean. This is my yoke. And Jesus wasn't the only one that had a yoke. All rabbis during his day had yokes. But especially for Jesus, his yoke wasn't just limited to his teachings, it encompassed his lifestyle, his way of life. So when he says, take my yoke upon you, he's not just saying, take all of my teachings, take all of my sermons, take all my interpretation and my materials. No, he's saying, Actually, look at the way that I live and model that. That is my yoke, my lifestyle, the way that I live. What Jesus is doing in this statement is he's contrasting his yoke as a rabbi with all of the other yokes of the other rabbis, Pharisees, and teachers of religious law. What he's doing, he's contrasting his way of life with theirs. He says, mine is easy and my burden is light as opposed to theirs, which is harsh and heavy and leaves you tired and weary. So let's go back, let's go through this passage verse by verse. Let's Start back with verse 28. He says, come to me, all of you that are weary and carry heavy burdens, I'll give you rest. You guys can leave that on the screen while I'm teaching through this. 
Some of the other translations, that word weary, they use all of you who labor, all of you who are tired, all of you who are troubled, all of you who are struggling under the weight of an ill-fitting yoke from other rabbis and teachers, and, and I'll give you rest. I'm not gonna pile more weight on it and make it harder and more difficult for you. No, I'll give you rest. See, what we often don't realize is that we sit at the feet of other rabbis and we take on their yokes, whether we realize it or not. We sit at the feet of others and we take on what they teach and we look at the way they live and we take that on for ourselves because it's more profitable, because it's going to advance our career, because it looks like it's more fun, because it's actually promising rest and relaxation and escape from the heavy burdens of the world. But in reality, those other yokes are just heavier and more burdensome, right? Because it's what the world is offering. And the world can never offer what Jesus promises. They can't. Listen, could I submit this to you today? If your current way of life feels heavy and burdensome and leaves you feeling tired, weary, troubled, and struggling, there's a very good chance that you have chosen a way and not the way. If you're here today and you look at your way of life and you identify with Jesus' invitation, I am tired, I am weary, I am struggling, I am burdened. Is there a chance that you have chosen a way rather than the way? In fact, and y'all hold your emails, okay? In fact, is there a chance that you've chosen the American way over the Jesus way? And again, before you send me your emails, Pastor Matt, that's not very patriotic. Well, I'm a child of God before I'm an American. Because this isn't going to be my home forever. Eternity is going to be heaven not the USA, not North Carolina. As much as I love where I live and I'm proud of that, that's not my final destination. That's not my ultimate citizenship. And here's the thing, though. We so readily accept these other ways that leave us tired and weary and worn out and struggling because we look around us and everyone else is living the same way, right? Every time you meet someone and you ask them, man, how are you doing? What are the typical responses? Oh, I'm busy, I'm tired, just trying to make it. And so we've accepted this because everyone else is living the same way and what do we tell ourselves? Well, I guess this is just the way that it is. What if it's not just the way that it is? What if it's just the way that you've chosen? What if it's not just the way that it is? What if it's the way that you've chosen? Because the reality is that you have gotten to where you are right now with the way things are because of all of the decisions that you've made that you've chosen along the way. What if there's a different way? What if there's a better way? And see, here's the thing. The way of Jesus will always look different from the way of the world. The way of Jesus will always feel different. It will always feel countercultural. It will always feel not normal. But listen, can I promise you this? It will always be a better way. It will always be a better way. 
Jesus continues in this, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. This is the second time in this passage that Jesus promises rest. The second time that he promises rest. The first was in the invitation to come to him. Now the second is in the request to allow him to be our teacher. So he says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Let me teach you and you will find rest. Listen, here's the truth that a lot of us are missing from these two verses. And it'll be on the screen. You can write it down. We find rest in both the presence and the practices of Jesus. It is in both the presence and the practices of Jesus. You guys leave that on the screen for a few more seconds, okay? But here's the thing. Rest only works when it is both and, not either or. We only get rest and find rest when it's both and, when it's the presence and the practices of Jesus, not the presence or the practices of Jesus. Because this is what we're guilty of so often. We come here on Sunday mornings and we bask in the presence of Jesus in worship, in fellowship, in teaching, in ministry, in prayer. And then we walk out of here and we never enter into his presence again for six and a half days. And then we wonder why. Why have I not found rest? Why has he not given rest? Why is the load still so heavy and burdensome? Or... We go out and we try to do the practices of Jesus apart from the presence of Jesus. And so now we have no power to do what he's called us to do. And then we get frustrated with that. Well, I'm trying to do everything he said to do, and it is not working. And I have not found rest, and I'm still tired and troubled and struggling and frustrated. It's because it has to be both and, it can't be either or. Jesus says, come to me, I'll give you rest. Let me teach you, you'll find rest. Why? Because I'm humble and I'm gentle. Unlike many of the other Pharisees and teachers of religious law during his time who were proud and arrogant and harsh. In fact, Jesus says something about them in Matthew 23. It says, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. Do what they say, don't do what they do. Why? For they don't practice what they teach. And in fact, in the, in the rest of this chapter, there are different paragraphs, and Jesus begins every paragraph by saying, woe to you, Pharisees, teachers of religious law, you hypocrites. One of our favorite words that we love to throw around. For they don't practice what they teach, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. The burden. Jesus says, I, I'm not like that. I'm not harsh and proud and arrogant. I'm not walking around just adding more weight to the load. Oh, hey, by the way, you forgot to do this. Oh, hey, by the way, just wanted to point that sin out to you. I'm not going to tell you how to make it any easier, but just wanted to throw another weight onto the load. All right, keep trucking on, good soldier. Hope you're able to please God. You probably won't be, but good luck to you. Jesus says, no, that's not me. I'm humble and gentle. Come to Jesus and he'll give you rest. Learn from Jesus and you will find rest. 
This is the Jesus way in his presence and his practices. And this is always the better way. The last verse, he says, for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. That word easy that Jesus uses, it's really better translated as well-fitting. Well-fitting. My yoke is easy. My yoke is well-fitting. My yoke is made for you. I don't know if you've ever tried to wear something before that didn't fit you quite right. If it's too big, you're tripping and falling all over the place. If it's too small, you can barely breathe or even move. It's not well-fitting for you. When our uh, oldest son, Caden, when he was real little, he had this fascination and obsession with shoes, and uh, particularly to other people's shoes. And so if we were at someone's house, um, he would find their shoes. And it didn't matter whose shoes they were. It could have been the parents. It could have been the kids. And if they just happened to catch his eye, he was like, yep, these are mine for the duration that we are here. (laughs) And so he'd find some, and he's like slipping his little feet into adult size 10, 11 shoes, and he's tripping all over the kitchen. Or he, he found, like, if they had a child that was younger, he found their shoes, and he's like, oh, I like the way these look. And he's like trying to cram his feet into them and his heels are hanging out the back. They're not fitting for him. Do you remember when David went to go fight Goliath? And do you remember when he went and met with King Saul first? And do you remember what Saul did? He said, all right, well, I mean, this is your funeral, kid, but if you're gonna go out, let's at least give you a fighting chance. He said, here, take my armor. And you remember, it says that the armor didn't fit David. It was big, it was heavy, it was bulky, it was clunky. He could barely even move around in it. Why? Because that armor wasn't made for him. It was made for Saul. David was trying to wear another man's armor and going off to fight. Listen, I feel like some of you here today You've been trying to fight your giants wearing someone else's armor that wasn't made for you. And you wonder why you're getting beat and you're losing every single time. You're taking on this yoke that the world is offering. And you're looking around and it's like, well, it appears to be working for everyone else. So why isn't it working for me? Why am I tired? Why am I exhausted? Why am I struggling? Why am I troubled? Why does this feel so heavy and weighty? Could it be that there's a different way? Could it be that there's a better way? His yoke, his teachings, his way of life, they are easy and well-fitting, and his burden is light. Did you notice that Jesus didn't say, and I will remove the burden? There will still be a burden because that's the purpose of a yoke. You yoke oxen to hitch them to a plow so that they can plow the field. The yoke is meant for work. And so if someone has ever promised you, well, yeah, following Jesus and living his lifestyle, that's going to be easy and you'll never have to do any work. I'm so sorry someone lied to you because that's not the truth. Jesus says, no, there's still going to be work. It's just not going to be as heavy. It's not going to be as burdensome. The other rabbis, the Pharisees, the teachers of religious law, listen, they taught over 600 commands found in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. In addition to rituals and traditions that had been developed and handed down over the years, plus take however they interpret the scriptures and they may add even more onto that. 600 plus Like, I don't know about you, but that makes me tired just hearing that number. 
Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. One day someone asked him a question. They said, hey, teacher, out of all the commandments, not just the top 10, but of all 600 plus, which is the most important? They're trying to trap Jesus in his answer so they can accuse him of Pharisee because the real answer was, well, they're all equally as important. If they all came from God, they're all important. And Jesus doesn't even skip a beat. He goes, man, that's easy. He goes, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He goes, and this one isn't even in my nose, but it's a free one. I'll give it to you anyway. Love your neighbor as yourself. He goes, you do those two things, you'll be good. Two answers. What did Jesus do in giving that answer? He offered his yoke and his burden. You want to know what it looks like to follow God? You want to know what it looks like to be my disciple? Here, here is the yoke. Love God and love others the same way you love yourself. Is that too hard? Is that too burdensome? Is that too heavy? What's interesting, too, is that you can take these two things, love God, love others, and you can put every teaching and command under one of those two categories. Let's just look at the top 10. First three commandments in the top 10. No other gods, no idols, don't take the Lord's name in vain. If you can do those three, you're loving God well. The remaining uh, the last six, honor your parents. That's loving others the same way you love yourself. Don't murder. It's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> don't commit adultery. Again, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet. And then there's that hinge point in the middle of remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy, which is loving God and loving yourself well. Because if you don't love God and you don't love yourself, you can't love others with the love of God. That's not even in here. That's free. Listen, if you're here today and you're tired and you're weary from shouldering a heavy burden with a yoke that just doesn't seem to fit, could I offer you a better way? Could I offer you the Jesus way? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Come to him and he will give you rest. Learn from him and you will find rest. Amen? Why don't you stand with me today as we wrap this up? So this message series has really been in preparation uh, for a few months now. And to me, it's, it's no surprise that God has orchestrated all in this perfect timing before we go into the holiday season. I don't know if you realize this, but um, Thanksgiving is only two and a half weeks away. Again, some of you like mild panic attack just now. You're like, again, in November? Good Lord which means Christmas is only seven weeks away. And as Christians, as believers, as disciples of Jesus, as followers of the way, these two holidays should be filled with gratitude and joy and love and hope and peace, which is true for all of you here this morning, right? Yeah, well, why are y'all laughing? Like I just made a joke. See, because for the reality, for many of us, whether Christian or not, let's be honest, the holidays are the most stressful time of the year. It is the time of the year that we feel the most weight and the heaviest burdens, that we are the most weary and tired and stressed and struggling during that time of year. Again, could it be that we have chosen a way rather than the way when it comes to even how we do the holidays? 
And so I just want to throw a question out this morning. What if your holidays could look different this year? What if they could be simpler? What if they could be slower? What if they could be easier? What if they could be lighter? What if you stop doing things the way you've always done them, which is why you keep getting the same results you've gotten every year? And what if you did things a different way this year? Church, there is a different way. There is a better way. And it is the way of Jesus. This is the way. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm sure during this whole sermon, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. He's been bringing about that gentle conviction, not guilt and condemnation, but conviction that only comes from him. And so maybe you're here today and you'd say, you know what, Pastor Matt, if I'm being real honest with myself today, yes, I've adopted a set of beliefs and I've put my faith in Jesus for who he is and all that he's done. But if I'm being honest today, I have not adopted his lifestyle. I'm trying to live like the rest of the world and still put my faith and hope in Jesus. And maybe today for the first time you're realizing, you know what, that just doesn't work. There's got to be a different way. There's got to be a better way. If you're here today and that's you, and you would just be willing to admit that I'm not living the Jesus way, would you be so brave to just look at me and raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you today. If that's you today, amen. Hands all over this place. You're not the only one. Amen. 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 You can put your hands down. Now. I want to offer the follow-up to that. Maybe you're here today. You would say, you know, I've never even really considered that there could be a different way or a better way. But I actually want to try it. I actually want to try it. I don't want my faith to just be about what I believe and that it doesn't impact the way that I live. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Matt, pray for me because I actually want to try living this Jesus way. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand and look up at me because I want to pray for you. Amen. I see that hand. Amen. 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 Well, Jesus, thank you that you came to show us the way. Lord, and not just the way to the Father, but the way to live our lives day to day. That here on this earth, we actually would have the chance and the opportunity to live life and live it more abundantly. Holy Spirit, I thank you for those who had the courage to raise their hands. God, and even for those who didn't, Lord, I pray this week you would open up our eyes to see things in a new way. Open up our eyes to see where we've chosen a way that is not the way. Lord, give us creativity to reorder our schedules, to reorder our lives, to begin doing things a different way and a better way. God, I thank you for the promise that your yoke is easy, that it, it fits us well, and that the burden you place upon us is light, which means through you, we can do it. In fact, through you, we can do all things because our strength is found in you. So Lord, thank you for coming. Thank you for modeling. Thank you for showing us a different way, a better way. Thank you for showing us the way. Lord, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. 